Conversations comes from PNC Bank. And here to say a few words, it's my pleasure to introduce PNC's Kristen Baird Adams, Chief Operating Officer, the Office of Regional Presidents. Kristen. Thanks, Mike, and good evening, everyone. Um, it is an honor and privilege to again welcome all of you to Cleveland Connects, a series, uh, as Mike said, of community conversations presented by Cleveland.com, The Plain Dealer, IdeaStream, and PNC. Now in its fifth year, we've covered quite a bit of ground together, uh, place-based development, transportation, justice reform, and as you'll recall, uh, early childhood education in last year's First 2000 Days series. Tonight's topic builds beautifully on that groundbreaking series, and it's perhaps one of our most transformative, potentially transformative topics, um, Cleveland's progress toward becoming a say yes city. Um, as you'll hear this evening, this, unprecedented, this is an unprecedented opportunity that positions Cleveland, as Mike said, to create a powerful continuum of wraparound health and human services, academic supports, and scholarships that, as you'll hear tonight, as other Say Yes cities have experienced, will put more of our city's children on a path toward a college degree or other post-secondary opportunities. We would like to extend our sincere thanks and appreciation to the many community partners, many who are gathered here tonight, with whom we have a privilege of working on advancing this critical effort, um, and of course, also to those who made tonight's program possible. Uh, special thanks to Advance Ohio Editor and President Chris Quinn, IdeaStream President and CEO uh, Kevin Martin, and the terrific news and production teams at both organizations who do an extraordinary job each and every day generating substantive content and information. Uh, we have a terrific uh, live studio audience gathered here tonight in the Westfield at IdeaStream. In addition, tonight's session of Cleveland Connects is airing statewide uh, on the Ohio Channel live and is being streamed live as well at ideastream.org and cleveland.com. Uh, Mike, as always, uh, we're very grateful to have you as our Cleveland Connects moderator. Um, thank you for your leadership in shaping tonight's program, and we'll turn the program back over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much, Kristen, for your leadership on important issues such as early childhood education and for PNC's support of Cleveland Connects. As mentioned, this is a community conversation. That means we need to hear your voice. There are several ways that you can join in. If you're watching us live on the web, send your questions now or your comments via email to connects at ideastream.org. You can also share your thoughts, comments, and especially your questions on Twitter. Use hashtag CLEConnects, that's C-L-E Connects. And those of you here with us in our Westfield Insurance Studio Theater, are you here with us? Let's hear it. Okay, we do have a studio audience. Those Those of you who are here and you can hear that they are here, feel free to share your thoughts by writing questions on the cards that you received when you entered. You just pass them to the end of your row where members of our IdeaStream team will collect them. And before we hear from our panelists, let's set the stage. The nonprofit Say Yes to Education has partnered with communities around the country for 30 years, not only to prepare students in public school for college, but to help pay for their post-secondary education. Since 2012, the Buffalo, New York public schools have partnered with Say Yes on sweeping efforts to increase high school graduation rates and get more students into college. IdeaStream's Darielle Snipes recently traveled to Buffalo to see how this partnership is working for the students, their families, and the school district. I always wanted to go to college, but growing up, my mom was like, I don't know how we're going to do this. 16-year-old Davon Chapman's dream is to become a chef but going to culinary school after high school seemed out of reach. It was kind of bad, because like I can do my best, and like what if I don't make it? I did all this for no reason. I'm not going to be able to go to college, and I'm not going to be able to make as much money as like I should be. And I thought it was bad. I was like, so I got to try my very best to do what I can. And then I got here, and things got really worse, and I just gave up. Shortly after Davon entered Hutchinson Technical High School last year in Buffalo, New York, he says he started having panic attacks because I get like really nervous and anxious around a lot of people. So I like kind of like they started happening. So I stayed home. I was probably home for altogether about like four months 
not at one time, but like all together. Um, it was bad. His dream of becoming a chef slipped further away as his grades began to drop. Davon's mother, Sherry, says she tried everything in her power to help her son, but it wasn't until Aaron Lowinger came into their lives that things started to change. He went from being very shut in his room all the time, very depressed. Now he goes to school every day. He's happy. I don't have to argue with him about getting up and going to school. That's To me, that's, that's a big issue. Like, I can see the difference in him from last year to this year. Lowinger is a family support specialist with Say Yes to Education Buffalo. The nonprofit program has specialists embedded at all Buffalo public and charter school buildings. He says he worked with Davon, called him, even took him to school some days, and set up a meeting between Davon and school officials to help get him back on track. There was a guidance counselor, there was an assistant principal, there was a teacher, there was students, and they all came in there and said, Devon, basically the message was, Devon, we love you, we want you here. Lowinger says they help families like the Chapmans get the help they need from social services to legal aid to student mentoring. We have a mental health clinic at the school that is open to all, that, that has me interacting with uh, uh, a lot of families in need in the school. Uh, we're starting a backpack program at, at my school, and a lot of my colleagues at Say Yes have this already, where uh, it's a partnership with the Food Bank of Western New York, so on Fridays uh, an allotment of food goes home in their backpacks. So there's a lot of ways that we're able to reach uh, kids in need throughout the school, not just the small kind of um, uh, set of uh, families and students that we're working with directly. The partnership between Say Yes, the Buffalo Public Schools, city, county, and state agencies, as well as corporate, nonprofit, and philanthropic sectors offers intense academic and social support to students in grades K-12 through public schools. And once they graduate, free tuition to participating universities, colleges, and trade schools. The goal is not to just get these students enrolled in college or post-secondary training and provide tuition, but ensure that once they're there, they have the skills and the support to succeed. Say Yes Buffalo Executive Director David Russ says since the initiative started here five years ago, hope of going to college has turned into reality for many students, especially for minorities. We've supported over 5,000 students with college tuition scholarships over the past five years and uh, it's starting to get into the fabric of this community now because originally it's hope and promise but now we've got siblings that have taken advantage, cousins, neighbors, and friends, and I think everybody understands now that that huge financial barrier of college tuition is removed. Those 5,000 students have received more than seven and a half million dollars in scholarships through Say Yes, money that was raised from the business, foundation, and private donations. To date, Say Yes Buffalo has raised $25 million toward the $33 million 10-year startup goal and $12.5 million toward the $100 million scholarship endowment. Russ says it has been challenging, but this is what's needed to ensure the success of these students and ultimately strengthen the Western New York economy by investing in the future workforce. The promise here is that through private sector we would fund a scholarship. Uh, but we wanted our public sector to help pay for things like extended learning time and social service caseworkers and building and mental health clinics. And even in big budgets, those are hard conversations to have um, because the need is huge. The investment is starting to pay off. The Buffalo Public Schools is reporting the graduation rate has increased 15 percent in the last four years to 64 percent. Among black males, the graduation rate in 2012 was just 40 percent. Last year, it jumped to 57 percent. The rate for black females rose from 51 percent to 71 percent in those same four years. Will Karustis is chief of intergovernmental affairs with the Buffalo School District. He says the graduation numbers are headed in the right direction, but still need work. There's been some progress on that, and really for a number of reasons. We, we certainly think Say Yes has contributed to the increase uh, in graduation rates, but we also know that Say Yes has also bolstered some of the programs that the district has and, ha and permitted them to be more successful, facilitated their success, so we now have some greater consistency. Say Yes Buffalo is helping families like the Chapmans get through their day-to-day -day difficulties and challenges so that they can make education their priority and Davon can achieve his goals of becoming a chef, tuition-free. I got hope, like every teenage should. It's really, how do I put this, my thoughts on it are way better 
Like, now I can do what I always wanted to be. Thanks to IdeaStream reporter Dariel Snipes for that report. So let's talk about how such a program might look in Cleveland. And to do that, we have a panel of people who've been collaborating on the Say Yes initiative. Eric Gordon is Chief Executive Officer of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Since his appointment in 2011, he's been responsible for the leadership and daily management of Cleveland's schools and its 39,000 students. Monica Price joined Mayor Frank Jackson's administration in October 2007 as the Chief of Education. Her responsibilities include advancing the mayor's vision to improve education for all Cleveland students and serving as the liaison between the city of Cleveland and the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. David Rust, who you saw in the video, is the executive director of Say Yes to Education in Buffalo. Prior to joining Say Yes Buffalo, David served as deputy commissioner for youth and social services for Erie County. Sharon Sobel Jordan is the chief of staff for Cuyahoga County. She supervises cabinet officers and serves as chief strategy officer and policy advisor to County Executive Armin Budish. Before joining the county, Jordan was president and CEO of the Centers for Families and Children, one of Northeast Ohio's oldest and largest nonprofit human services organizations. And Augie Napoli is president and chief executive officer of United Way of Greater Cleveland. Prior to his 2016 appointment, he served as deputy director and chief advancement officer of the Cleveland Museum of Art. He has 40 years of nonprofit executive experience in Northeast Ohio. And finally, the effort to bring Say Yes to Cleveland involves a broad community partnership that has been working behind the scenes for several years. Two key partners in that coalition, not on this stage tonight, have been the Cleveland Foundation, and in particular, <coughs> Program Officer Helen Williams, and College Now Greater Cleveland and its CEO, Lee Friedman. They're with us in the audience tonight. As I spoke to each of the panelists individually ahead of this conversation, I kept hearing two themes, which I'll call <coughs> help and hope. Help being the services offered to students and family, and hope being that college or post-secondary training is possible and that finances won't be a barrier. And it made me think, is this a new way, a way of redefining what school is? David, is it? I love help and hope. In Buffalo, we call it the push of the scholarship and the pull of wraparound supports to help students actually access that scholarship, whether that's two, three, or five years from now. Uh, one of the great promises which we tried to, to make and keep over the years is taking a very broad view of what public education looks like today. And I think the days of a nine to three school system, they're just not working right now. So can we reimagine a public education system and invest as many supports as we can into our public school buildings, social service caseworkers, extended learning time, mental health clinics, legal clinics. You've got this great infrastructure and you can invest these wraparound supports directly in a public school building. And you know, while there's no silver bullet in doing this work, ultimately it's gonna push outcomes further for young people, whether that's five, 10 or 15 years down the road. Um, and I think it's the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. You know, otherwise we are leaving talent on the sidelines. You know, I love being in Cleveland. Thank you for having me. We consider this a sister city. Uh, and it's great to see Northeast Rust Belt cities trying to reinvent themselves and do really hard work. Um, but we have left talent on the sidelines. And I think there's direct ties between your educational attainment and your own personal fortune and the economic development of a region. Um, in Buffalo, we've got cranes going up, buildings getting rebuilt. This is just as important, you know, investing in the human infrastructure of your city that's ultimately going to take jobs and work here and live here and contribute to your community in a very meaningful fashion. You know, in Buffalo, we haven't reached every neighborhood yet. We are going to do that by education, our, educating our young folks, helping them get to college or post-secondary, and ultimately living and working in Buffalo and contributing to our community in a very meaningful fashion. So I think you are right on with, with the hope and the help, and uh, it's smart to take a broad view of public education right now. Eric Gordon, what David just said is that the days of nine to three school are over. Schools are expected to do a whole lot more. Report cards just came out. Not particularly great if you look at the card and see the number of Fs for the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. So what about those critics who might say, concentrate on reading, writing, and arithmetic, and this is just something that we really can't take on? How would you answer that? Well, I think our community's already actually answered that question. Our reform strategy is not called the Cleveland School District Plan. It's called the Cleveland Plan. And it has, from its inception, been a collaboration among all of the stakeholders who are all invested in making sure our kids succeed. Uh, to David's point, this is a community that really understands our economic vitality. We will thrive only when we have a sound education system uh, that is at the core of that and driving that. And so we as a community have answered that question. 
Uh, the reality is that we are focused on reading and math and you know the reading, writing, arithmetic, and, and the report card uh, does show we have a long way to go before we meet Ohio standards. I've been saying that uh, for a long time. The, I could have told you that before they were released. What it also said, though, was that we more than doubled the number of students in kindergarten through third grade who caught up in their reading last year and passed 88 other districts in Ohio. That's on the report card. So it's not that somehow we should stop focusing on making sure kids are really good readers and really good at mathematics and so on. It is that in addition to doing those things, we as a community really have to bear down on removing those barriers that get in the way of learning so that we can do what we already know and through results that we can do better. Monica, what we what you hear a lot about this is that it's a, a promise program, a promise of a scholarship. Mm -hmm. That gets the headlines. Mm -hmm. For you, it's the other part, the wraparound that, that is the most important. In fact, I think for each of you when I spoke with you. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you see this more as a as the help part and the hope is important too, but the help is first. Why well, when I look at education, I see it as the key, the foundation or the gateway to one's relative success. And I also look at Say Yes to Education as a redevelopment of economics through education. And so we've been working collectively as a, co a collective impact model um, to build public will, to change the mindsets, to change the way we think about post-secondary educational attainment. And why is that important? And so when we look at our region, um, we know that 1% increase in um, post-secondary education attainment brings 2.8 billion, with a B, billion dollars, thereby spurring the economy. And those who obtain post-secondary educational attainment via um, uh, stackable certificates, um, two-year degree, four-year degree, they then earn approximately $1 million more um, in their lifetime um, versus someone who hasn't obtained uh, post-secondary educational attainment. And then when you look at Cleveland specifically, citizens who are 25 years old um, and older have only obtained some college just under 45%. And those of the same age have obtained only 15% of a bachelor's degree or higher. And so when you increase educational post-secondary attainment, it does a multitude of things for our economy, for our city, and increasing the tax, uh, increased consumer spending, there are all these positives. So it doesn't matter who says it. If I say it, the Federal Reserve CEO for, um, for uh, cities, no matter who says it, it's a positive thing for our, um, for our economy, but it also provides, again, hope and opportunity for our young people, and those wraparound services um, help them as well, beyond the academics. Augie Napoli with United Way, the big push is anti-poverty, and we have plenty of problems and pockets of poverty in Northeast Ohio. Do you see this, Say Yes to Education, as an anti-poverty program? Well, absolutely. I mean, the goal of uh, Say Yes is a job at a living wage, and the pathway to that is starts at pre-K and goes all the way through graduation and into some post-secondary education and training so that there can be a li living wage. Look, our experience is it, with poverty, most people want to be self-sustaining. They want to take care of themselves. They want to take care of their families, put a roof over their head, feed their families, uh, and educate their families. But unless we can provide the services to those that ha are struggling with uh, the effects of poverty in their life, to work with them and their children to get them through, we're never gonna break this cycle. And so it's absolutely an anti-poverty. It's really a uh, long view though. It's it is not something very, you can get a payoff on next year. Of course, and, and this is a big investment that uh, the community's making. But you know, the hope part of this, and I, I, I get the dollars and cents and the economic vitality and all of that's hugely important but it's the hope that it can happen and, and that the community will come together around people in need. Uh, so deepen the understanding of, of the needs of our friends, our neighbors, our family, people around us. Um, it's hugely important for the hope part of this. Sharon, the county already is the biggest provider of health and human services, uh, the county itself. 
This would be a way to coordinate what's already being done around these students. How does this change things? And in fact, it already has. We're already seeing collaboration just because you're looking at the Say Yes model. Uh, how would things change and in, in what way would you, would these wraparound services help these students get to the end goal, which is attainment of a degree and post-secondary education? Right. Um, you know, this is very important. Uh, this has been a part of our strategy all along and Say Yes fits very well into that. When we talk about, the, I think we're on the help side of the hope and help, we're putting literally mil uh, hundreds of millions of local dollars into just anti-poverty, um, helping people who are in poverty right now sort of make it every day. In addition to that, we have billions of dollars coming into our community from the state and federal government for public benefits for people who are living in poverty. None of this is really calculated to help them move out of poverty. It's really just helping them with their day-to-day -day lives. Think if we could give kids the help in school when they're there to build the skills they need to come out of school ready for post-secondary to be successful there and launch their careers. I mean, this is the ultimate breaking the cycle of poverty. Mm -hmm. And if we could do that and turn them into productive citizens that are contributing to our economy, think if we could turn our dollars back from the back end into the early side, it could really make a difference. We at the county have made a big push to invest in early childhood education, as you know. That's been our number one priority because we know if we can get them in the early side, then hopefully we'll be investing later, you know, less later. And so this fits right in. Um, say yes in the pathway milestones. Mm -hmm. The very first pass pathway milestone to this launching a career after post-secondary is kindergarten readiness. And this community, uh, especially the county, is already well invested and ahead of it curve, mm -hmm. I think in most places in the country, and getting kids ready for kindergarten. So we view this as really um, right in line with our strategy, and getting us all aligned and marching in the same direction is really a plus of this AS model. A reminder that if you're watching us live on the web, send your questions or comments now via email to connects at ideastream.org. Be sure to share your thoughts, comments, and especially your questions too via Twitter. You use the hashtag CLE Connects, that's CLE Connects. And again, for our studio audience, please pass your note cards to the end of the row, and we'll try to get your questions incorporated into the conversation, too. Uh, David Rust, in Buffalo, how difficult was it to get the Say Yes model up and running? Cleveland's at that point now where, we're, where the city is looking to partner with Say Yes. That hasn't been decided yet. Uh, what were the biggest barriers? You know, we have wonderful partners in Buffalo that have made this work, although the work is hard, easy when you're in it together. You know, I don't think you have one entity in the center, kind of that Eric is referring to, that can just take on these really challenging, complex problems that have taken 40, 50 years to develop on their own. We have a coalition of partners, and you can't do it alone. You know, we have private sector at the table, similar to United Way and the, the Cleveland Foundation. Uh, we certainly have county government at the table, who is our biggest provider of health and human services as well. We have our city government at the table, where we have the largest concentration of youth. In Western New York, we have 165,000 open jobs projected in the next decade, uh, with two-thirds requiring a post-secondary credential. We won't, don't have that many people that are going to move to Buffalo and Western New York. The opportunity is right there in our city, and we have a school district with, that is charged uh, with educating young people. Uh, and we've chosen to work together and, and hold hands and do it. Um, certainly unions are at the table, higher ed, parent leadership. Um, it's a brilliant approach, uh, and it's simple, and I think that's what is brilliant about it. And I promise you here in Cleveland, you have all the answers here in this room today and in this community to do this hard work. It is just choosing to do it together and, and choosing to focus on some really important goals, such as more high school graduates and more college or post-secondary graduates in this region. And Mike, just to build on that from, yeah. from our perspective here in Cleveland, so I've been in Cleveland for 11 years now, and one thing that I've been able to proudly say when I talk to my peers across the country is I've never seen a city uh, anywhere else I've been where the people in the city have stayed steadfastly focused on getting education right as a community. I've seen cities that focus on education, and, and it's a philanthropic good thing to do, and then they focus on the elderly or they focus on the ill, and then they come back around to education, but not here. From the day that I've come, our community has been focused on getting this right and really staying the course. So we have an advantage in that all of us, every one of us, have been working together on trying to figure this out collectively for years. And so we have a lot to build on uh, to, to move us through this uh, final next 12 to 18 months to really achieve this goal. Because it's something that uh, not only the people here on the panel, but in this audience have been fighting for collectively for over a decade in our city. Speaking about this audience, we do have some questions 
Let's start with the first one. What are the supports for students who may not be college bound and instead looking to be career ready? We've talked about college, but we've also thrown out the term post-secondary education and training. So this isn't necessarily just a college program. College isn't for everyone. Right. Monica, what about that? Well, we, in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, we actually have career tech education. And Say Yes to Education actually supports career tech education, two-year degrees and four-year degrees. So you are correct in saying it is not just for a year. It does support that, however, it supports post-secondary educational attainment, and that is all inclusive of those particular components that I mentioned. Next question from our audience. Is our money better invested with early childhood education? Isn't that what the research shows as having the greatest impact? You mentioned yeah. already that the county is plowing money into that. Uh, what about that as an argument? It sounds like an either or question. Would yeah, you say it, it's, it's not? It's a both and. Yeah, it's absolutely so. a both and. We know that if kids in the first 2,000 days get an excellent education, if they go to substandard schools without the supports, they lose all the gains they make. So it has to be a both and. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's why, again, the Say Yes uh, model is so good because the first pathway milestone is kindergarten readiness. So it absolutely recognizes that. And we all invest in kindergarten readiness because of you know, we want to get kids through college or post-secondary right. to launch careers. It's really not just about kindergarten. I would agree with that. The, you know, the fact of the matter is we're all working on various parts of this and have been for some time, but there's not been the collective energy around working on a common solution. What, do, what role does United Way play? What role does the county play? How do we align our, the work that we're doing, our strategies, uh, to pass the baton one from another all the way along the way? You can't lose sight. There isn't any one of these things that is more important than the other, although the first step, the pre-K, is certainly very important. But you know, if the goal is to get a job and be at a living wage and to stay in the community and contribute economically, then you got to start at the beginning with it, and we have to be constant all the way. The Say Yes model um, really is brilliant in its simplicity in that it has forced this community, I think, to work at a much deeper level uh, with each other than we have in the past. I mean, just with the county alone, uh, the strategic plan that the county has for health and human services, like Buffalo, $4 billion worth of uh, health and human service dollar come into this community. We're plowing $40 million into the community as well we can align our services, our work together in a much better way, much more effectively. I think the difference, if I could just add, is that um, this is helping us align around the end we want to see. We're all working towards post-secondary completion and career readiness. We're not aligning around homelessness or, you know, or, you know, other issues. It's really where do we want to get our kids, not where they are now, what not the need that it is today, which is, I think, really exciting and making us do things in a much different way. And, and I would just say, uh, when we think about, so where do we invest, say yes, it should be thought of as a safety net. So that it, as a, a young child grows throughout their career, gets ready to go to college and, and then back into our job workforce, you, you, can come, you can find yourself in an unsafe place needing help at any point in that spectrum. There's not somebody in this audience who's a parent that hasn't seen one time in their child's life where they're going, ooh, I'm really worried about him or her being okay. The, the issue is, is there a safety net? So today, um, I had a parent who reached out to me, uh, and she has two daughters that have already graduated. Her son is a senior in high school, in one of our high schools. So this is uh, young people who have been successful all of their way. Right now, she and her family are going through some very difficult things, and she's concerned that he won't make it the last six months. So if we had only said, well, we'll only invest in a period, we would have to say, well, then too bad, good luck, as opposed to having a safety net. And I very literally was thinking about of all the resources that we would have if this were a SAS community, mm -hmm. that I could immediately point that family to. Uh, and, and so just keeping in mind that this isn't, there is no one right point where every kid gets everything they need. This is a safety net to ensure that they complete that journey, just like any parent wants to do. And, you know, the educational component of it is only one aspect of it. When you talk about, it's called wraparound services for a reason. And it, they wrap around not only the child but the family. And what does each one of those children and families need individually? Uh, the way of um, social service delivery is case management, and you have, to, you have to address those needs. You come into a school not ready to learn that day because you don't have uh, breakfast. You, you know, you haven't had had time to uh, do your uh, your homework, or you haven't had the guidance and leadership. 
So a whole variety of reasons that, uh, that, that we need to provide these services. So it's equal measure for organizations like the United Way and the county to provide those services so that can happen. And other good things can happen as well. It's a good spot as you're talking about wraparound services to bring another voice into the conversation. Kurt Caracol is president of the Third Federal Foundation. He's invested more than, the organization has invested more than $25 million in its corporate headquarters in Cleveland's Slavic Village neighborhood. The foundation has also invested heavily in the people of the neighborhood through literacy, education, health care, and housing. Their P-16 educational program, in partnership with the CMSD, aims to provide high-quality education and community programs for children from birth through college or trade school, graduation. And by the way, IdeaStream's education staff has been participating as a member of the P-16 program since its inception. Kurt is with us in the audience, and Kurt, welcome. Very good to have you with us. Thank you. So in the seven years that the P-16 program has been operating as Slavic Village, what kind of changes have you seen in terms of measuring student success? Well, in a distressed community like, like uh, Slavic Village, uh, the, the vast majority of students live in abject poverty. 100% of our students qualify for, for free and reduced lunch. Um, so the, the list of barriers that poverty creates to prevent education from going forward is long. Um, and Third Federal has invested about a million and a half dollars a year in, um, about a million and a half dollars a year in bringing partners together to create programs that have created housing stability, that have created health care by creating clinics in the schools, by um, addressing literacy programs, by providing after-school programs that really try to support families in the, in the Slavic Village neighborhood. And what we've been able to see is we've been able to see the, new, the needle move. We've, we've invested a million and a half dollars for seven years, and this past summer, one of our worst performing schools, the principal called and said that their kindergarten through third grade reading has improved from an F to a D. That's the first time they've ever had a D, and so we celebrate that D because it's, it's, it's evidence that we've made some progress. So we've been able to see that attendance has improved, that, um, that, that the attendance at our after-school programs have improved, um, that people are staying healthy, people are being in school on a more regular basis, and we're seeing the needle move on academic success. Thank you, Kurt. So Eric, is that kind of a, a mini model of what we might be talking about, or even the wraparound services that the schools have uh, coordinated with United Way on? Are those models of what we might see? That's exactly the, the uh, kinds of things that we envision at a citywide scale. And, and so uh, one of the things that Curtin does in his work in the P-16 model, we also have it in Central Promise Neighborhood and in our wraparound schools, is really try to be the, the single point of entry where a, a kid or his or her family can gum, come and get the help that they need to remove the barriers that are preventing them from being engaged in school. Uh, one of the things that Kurt and his team discovered right away is that even though uh, Slavic Village is actually fairly isolated by highways and train tracks and one of our more stable communities, um, because of it also being the, the epicenter of the mortgage crisis in our, in our city and in our country, uh, he was finding, and his teachers know this as well, that the class of kids they started with at the beginning of the year was completely different from the class they ended with at the end of the year. And that's because our kids had to move. Okay. But we don't have any system in place to create that stability. Simple things like the legal clinics that, that uh, we have borrowed from Buffalo and started adding in our schools so that if a family gets a eviction notice, all of us would reach out and say, what do I do? I, I'm not getting evicted, I have to keep my family. My family's put stuff in garbage bags and move. And so how do we disrupt that so that they stay put? Uh, and those are the kinds of things that we're already doing in lots of places in our city, but we have to make sure that we do absolutely every time for every kid for their entire career. That leads to an audience question on that point. Uh, what has been the impact of the legal clinics in Buffalo? Have people used them? Yeah, so we have six clinics at this point in time. Uh, our district's a little bit smaller than Cleveland, but that's the appropriate number, and they're staffed collectively by seven large firms on a pro bono basis, and also uh, the lawyers from our mayor's office as well, so a nice opportunity for mm -hmm. further engagement mm -hmm. here in Cleveland. And we have hundreds of families that use them on an annual basis. Uh, many of the drivers are access to benefits, immigration, family law, uh, 
any number of uh, civil legal challenges, which could ultimately present a big challenge for families. Uh, we also work closely with our volunteer lawyers, um, nonprofit partners uh, in the community as well. So, you know, we've got a lot of stories that uh, Eric is referring to that are very similar in Buffalo. Landlord tenant disputes are a challenge. We now have a means to respond to that challenge in a very tangible way. We follow the case to a conclusion, and we do see good outcomes for uh, our families in, the, in, in Buffalo. So, a good investment and one that we are, you know, pleased to continue in partnership. Let's turn our attention now to the topic of money. Say Yes to Education would provide a $15 million gift to the community along with 30 years of experience of giving tuition grants. Cleveland, for its part, would need to find local donations, by most estimates, at least $100 million and probably significantly more to sustain the scholarships. It is a big ask. Let's pause for just a moment as Ideastream's Darielle Snipe looks at some of the other high-dollar, high-profile fundraising efforts of recent years. In 2000, the Cleveland Orchestra completed a $36 million renovation to Severance Hall. The Cleveland Museum of Art's soaring atrium renovation cost $350 million. It was completed in 2012. Public Square quickly raised $50 million for its redesign, completed in 2016 in time for the Republican National Convention. And Cleveland's Museum of Natural History is undergoing a $150 million renovation, due for completion in 2020. Augie, you're in the business of raising money to help with community concerns. Is there a concern that when we put together an ask for $100 million or more, that might affect other nonprofits and all the other safety nets we've talked about? Well, I think there's always a concern when you're talking about raising money. Uh, it is a bit of the fear, fear of the unknown. Uh, can we do it? Can we take on one more? Uh, my experience tells me that this is a very generous community and uh, people want to see Eric, I think, said it uh, best, uh, you know, in, in, there isn't an initiative that's gone on in this community that hasn't been connected to uh, education and how do we break the cycle, what do we do about that. Um, I think there's always a concern. Uh, but I wouldn't be overly concerned about that. I think uh, this community views this as an investment. Monica said it, uh, uh, Sharon has said it uh, many times, this is about building the economy. It's the, the economic impact of an educated workforce right here in Cleveland will come back uh, a thousand fold. Um, yeah, $100 million is a lot, but boy, what price can you put on the lives of yet another generation or two? or three that aren't being able to pull themselves out. It's a small price to pay in my estimation. I'm not raising, I'm not writing the check, but we, United Way certainly is, is participating in it. But I think we'll find um, really great support for this community-wide, uh, not only with the corporations and the foundations, but individual citizens, I think. You know, this enables us to shine the very brightest light on what's going on in our community in a way that we haven't been able to break through. You know, you have read, I'm sure, the series that uh, Cleveland.com is, uh, is running now on poverty in, in, uh, in this area. And I think that alignment of that message from the major media outlet in Northeastern Ohio on this issue enable, it enables all of us to uh, add to the chorus of that. So, I, you know, I. I wouldn't be, um, I'd be cautiously optimistic. I wouldn't be too concerned. Is this the same way you felt when you raised $350 million? <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and the community is very generous. Who doesn't want to invest in helping someone uh, and helping another, a child progress? Who wouldn't want to do that? If you can show them the pathway, and I think this plan, the Say Yes plan, is absolutely the clearest, most articulate plan of that pathway that I have seen, and I believe this community in 40 years I've lived here as far as education is concerned. Sure. I just wanted to add that I do think there always is a short term, as Augie so well said, uh, concern because it's going to change the way we do things. But so many of us give so many dollars for so long and poverty seems so big and so unsolvable. This is a path to breaking right. that cycle. Right. It, it's clear, yeah. we can see it. Mm -hmm. And it's, for the first time it feels very tangible. Why wouldn't we invest those dollars? And so we all need to think about, you know, if we just keep giving and doing the things we're doing, we're going to be doing this forever. This is a chance to change that, and so are we up for, you know, maybe 
a little bit of short-term pain to really get it right in the long term. And I think we're all here right. because we are. Mm -hmm. but, but is it a proven path? That's the question. There, it's, it, it's not as though we've seen the Say Yes programs last long enough to say this is improving entire communities and raising them out of poverty. So it, there has to be a little bit of faith in that. Well, if I could just add to that, um, I, I do think there is, but is the path we're on a better a path right. to that, to solving right. poverty? I think we'd all probably say no. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing that I love about the Say Yes model, and I think, Dave, you could talk about this, is that they customize it to each community. Right. It, it changes and evolves and improves mm -hmm. with each community. So just as much that Say Yes could bring to us, I think Cleveland has a lot to bring to Say Yes. And I'm sure Buffalo felt the same way when you started. Yeah, the stage is representative of you of your local leaders here who don't have to do this work, they're choosing to do this work, and more importantly, choosing to do it together and paving a pathway for, for this to succeed here. Um, you're using the right language already. It took us a while in Buffalo to get to see this as an investment as opposed to donations, right? When you raise money, people always think you're asking for donations. But it's an investment, and I am right with you. If you can raise $350 million for cultural institutions and $150 million for another, you can raise $100 million to send every young person in this community forever onto a college post-secondary program, and the economic returns alone that will bring to your community will pay off tenfold. And you know, what an opportunity, what a special point in time if you're a young person in the Cleveland Public Schools to know that people believe in you and this community believes in you and they believe in you to the tune of $100 million. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lofty goal um, in terms of the investment in Buffalo, it's choosing to pay off. You know, we are in no ways declaring victory or saying we are done, but our graduation rate is up 15 percentage points. Our, uh, attainment of matriculation into college is up eight percentage points. We passed national averages for urban districts. In fact, we're 12 percentage points ahead of them. So the data is there and you capture that story and it's compelling and you meet these young people and they will tell the story themselves far better than any of us can. So a huge opportunity and uh, I'm really hoping it's one that Cleveland chooses to grab. Eric? I think it's equally yeah. important to point out what we didn't bring to the community and what we're not asking for. So there are other college scholarship programs. The Promise programs are, are pretty well known, mm -hmm. actually. And it would have been very easy, frankly, to for me as the leader to go to, to our community organizations and say, help me go raise $100 million to give scholarships to kids and let's call it a day. But that's not what this is. And you actually raised earlier, when you talked to us, every one of us said, yeah, the scholarship, it, it turns out to be really important at the end, but we're really even more excited about the alignment of services and supports, that safety net, so that we get people there. So we're not, uh, we're not uh, preparing to come to our community and say, hey, those who have private and philanthropic dollars, put it in the scholarship fund and hope or have faith that if we just keep doing what we're doing, it's gonna matter. But we're actually saying we have to very intentionally do business differently at the county, the city, and the district and how we align all of those public dollars that are either raised locally through our taxes or at state and federal dollars coming to our community. And we are asking you to uh, hold us accountable by you bringing to the table the scholarship dollars, but only if and when we do our part, which is a really key portion and a big difference in say yes. Oh, I've said it. Uh, Monica. Say, uh, many people think that uh, our uh, taxes, the city taxes, will pay for this effort, and our taxes will not pay for this. But frankly, I think, as many of us said, um, um, when you talk about educating a child, it is an investment, investment in this child who is going to be our future. And frankly, I think it's what's right and just and what we ought to be doing. Sure. I just wanted to add that the one piece I don't think we've talked about is that the investment and the, and the, the way we align services is based on real-time data about each child. So right now we're doing it because it, you know, it feels right, somebody needs something, someone needs to go to a clinic. People are going to the legal clinic because the indicators on that child that day show that that family needs mm -hmm. that to keep that child in school and achieving. That's something that we're all very excited about, right. and that is a game changer here. And David, let's talk about that. It's a customized computer program that would follow each student, have the indicators of the, the things they need, the wraparounds that they need, and then be able to allow you to insert yourself into those situations. Yeah, and when you roll this out, I would say it's, it's a big effort, um, and some parts of this move ahead of others. You know, as a quick example, we were able to quickly align social service casework type positions in all the public schools, the mental health clinics in all the schools. Um, you know, incorporating a data system takes time, it's culture change, uh, but certainly, I mean, having a tool that allows you to, to link students directly to services is a bonus. So we're entering year six and we're just getting that part of it rolling this year. 
uh, that part has taken time, although kids are robustly using the services. We had 4,500 students access the mental health clinics this past year. 18.5% uh, of the students in our public school district received a service from our social service caseworkers, whether that's a quick intervention like food, clothing, shelter, or a more intensive child welfare intervention related to, to school attendance. But this year, every Monday, as, as surveys are returned and we're able to identify this is a student in need of vision, this is a student in need of dental or social services, that data goes out to the field and you're able to respond to it. So you're right, it's not I feel, it's I know this is a problem mm -hmm. and you can respond to it accordingly. Um, and it's something we could learn together on, you know, with Buffalo and Cleveland. We're three hours away. Right. Our cities are very similar. I think it's a great opportunity to have a learning community of, of sister cities that have very similar challenges, uh, trying to meet them in a comprehensive fashion. Getting back to the money, though, you have raised millions of dollars, but mm -hmm. you haven't raised enough money to say we're covering scholarships now in perpetuity. There's a lot of work yet to be done. In North Carolina, the first year kind of depleted the stores and they said we're going to have to sort of lower the 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 promise a mm -hmm. little bit what about that concern the idea that you've got to sort of adjust either the eligibility or what it is you're promising students and the idea of really having to raise that much money it's not been easy well raising money is hard i think augie would tell you that if you're willing to people ask if you're willing to ask people for their money uh, you have to listen and you have to prove you're making a good investment mm -hmm. so we i ask for money every single day and say yes buffalo um, you know, in terms of what happened in North Carolina, that's a separate chapter in its own entity. And I would defer to our national office on that as I'm solely focused on the efforts in Say Yes Buffalo and leading the efforts there. But we have raised to date uh, about 25 million out of our 10 year goal, which is a pay as you go model. It's our, our goal there is 33 million. Uh, our long term goal is similar to yours, a $100 million uh, endowment. And we would use the interest off that to pay for this in perpetuity. We've raised about 12 million, and we did just receive a $10 million gift from our New York State Economic Development Funds, uh, who see this as a workforce development initiative. So in some ways, that's gonna close, not, not in some ways, it closes our 10-year gap and gets us fully into endowment fundraising, and we will continue to work to be a good investment. Um, the philanthropic scene in Buffalo is different than here. We have two, our two, the, the net combined assets of our two largest foundations is 600 million, uh, our community foundation and a private foundation. We have a few hundred million dollar foundations. We have very generous individuals. Um, and we'll continue to work to be a good investment, but um, raising money is hard. It's something you don't take for granted. And uh, you know, we hope our outcomes and our students will allow us to get to that lofty fundraising goal long-term. I think to the fundraising point, if we think about this in terms of what has happened in the past and in the recent past, and not think about what can happen in the future, I believe I've seen it happen many times. Donors are and, and funding sources are going to materialize that didn't exist before. When they see the momentum of this, when they see the investment, if we do our job correctly in communicating uh, the potential of this uh, to break the cycle of poverty, this community is going to find donors that didn't exist before. There is a vast network of mid-sized and small companies out there <clears throat> that don't have the habit of philanthropic investment in the community, but they know uh, that for them to survive and to thrive into the future, they're going to have to build their workforce. And if we, we can make this case that you can connect those dots through a program like this, I believe that you're going to see a whole lot more come that hasn't existed before. So don't limit ourselves to just what we know to be the tried and true, you know, uh, because there's great potential out there. Just a few more minutes left in our conversation, but a few more questions too from our audience. Is there concern that students or parents will misunderstand the meaning of a last dollar scholarship for tuition as opposed to a full ride that covers the cost of attendance? Will parents or students be left disappointed? Is it an education issue to say this is what we're talking about with the scholarship? And is Cleveland's the same as Buffalo, the same last dollar promise? Mm -hmm. We are last dollar. What's uh, that mean? So we come in after federal aid and after state aid that students are able to access uh, given their family's financial circumstances. So we're very clear that we're a tuition scholarship. In some cases, we do do more for students that have significant need and need some assistance with books and fees. Uh, and you'll take that into account as you do your modeling, but communicate, communicate, communicate. It's a communications function. We spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, we have three full-time communications individuals, uh, and we rely on our partnership with the district, counselors, parents, et cetera. Uh, so I'd work through operating committee, but you know, initially I think that communications aspect of it is critical in, in getting the messaging right to families and students. See, Eric, is one of the things that will happen as a result of this that you might have more middle class or wealthier families 
want to either move into the district or stay because of the promise of the scholarship, not necessarily as much the wraparound services. And is that a good thing or a bad thing, given that somebody who doesn't qualify for as much financial aid might be a bigger price for the district to pay because you're covering a bigger part of their tuition? Well, so absolutely. We would, we would expect and frankly hope that we would see a reintegration into our mm -hmm. city and our city schools uh, and that uh, part, part of the, one of the best ways to pierce the shackles of poverty is for us not to all be in concentrated poverty. Um, when we look at the impact on schools and educations and, and we can see this in cities like Chicago uh, where they have been able to do some reintegration by wealth um, and resources, everybody wins. And, and so the, the difference here though and why we have been so careful not to follow a more traditional promise model is that without the additional supports that our current kids and families often need, remember we are the second highest childhood poverty in America. And so worse than Buffalo, our kids need the support. Without those supports, families move back in, they take advantage of the promise scholarship while our existing families get left behind. With the supports, everybody's able to move further and faster. And you know, one of the things that you, know, you raised earlier is, well, we don't have the 30-year evidence yet. And you're right. But we do have the evidence from Buffalo, right up our, our street, you know, three hours away. Mm -hmm. uh, their graduation rate is up about 15%. Ours is up 20%. Um, our college remediation rates are down 14%, so our kids are more ready. The big difference between the Say Yes City of Buffalo and the city of Cleveland is that their college access rates are up 10%, ours are down 10%. So how is it that we have more kids graduating more ready but fewer going to college? It is last dollar. It's that, you know, I, I went, walked into a restaurant last fall um, on a Sunday uh, to meet some people and I found one of my kids sitting in a booth that was a senior at Morehouse College. And I said, why are you here? And he said, well, I was $800 short, I didn't go back to school a senior at Morehouse College. It wasn't performance, it wasn't ability, it was $800. He wasn't asking for a full ride, he was asking for $800, right? And we know, particularly in Ohio, we're the 45th out of 50 states in supporting college access, that if we don't find a way to invest in this workforce and get our kids to and through, uh, we are not going to change the cycle. The good news is Cleveland's a boomerang, tank, a boomerang town. We all love to come home. So if we do get this right, or when we do get this right, they will be here investing in our community because of this. We have just one minute left, and Monica, perhaps you can put a cap on this for us. You and I talked a little bit about uh, the idea of the scholarship providing hope for mm -hmm. young people in the city of Cleveland. Can we end it on that note of hope? Tell me what you're hoping we would see once Say Yes is implemented, if it is here. I think it will provide um, promise, opportunity, and hope for our young people who would not otherwise endeavor to pursue post-secondary um, uh, educational attainment. They can dream, and per perhaps previously they weren't able to dream, but now they can dream, but not only dream, see a path towards achieving those particular aspirations. And so we are all very excited about the prospect of becoming a say yes to education in Cleveland. And not just the kids themselves, but their parents too. Perhaps That's we're exactly talking about right. generations That's who didn't exactly consider right. post-secondary education. Right. Now it's something the entire family can consider? That's exactly so right. right. So they can all come together, hope, dream, and have opportunity and promise towards their particular aspirations for their young people. Guys, thank you so much for a terrific conversation. I appreciate all, appreciate all of you for being here, and I appreciate our audience again. Can we hear from you? Great. That is going to conclude our discussion, but before we wrap things up, I'd like to thank each of our panelists individually. Augie Napoli, very good to have you with us today, as well as Sharon Sobel Jordan, David Rust, Monica Price, and Eric Gordon. And thanks to Kurt Caracol, who's in our studio audience as well. Cleveland Connects Say Yes to Education is a project of Ideastream, Cleveland.com, The Plain Dealer, and sponsor PNC Bank. And if you'd like to find out more, I'm going to invite you now to visit two websites. You can go to ideastream.org slash Cleveland Connects or go to cleveland.com slash say hyphen yes. Both sites have stories, audio and video, interactive maps, and links to other relevant information. IdeastreamCleveland.com and The Plain Dealer will bring you in-depth coverage about Cleveland's Say Yes to Education initiative as this important community conversation and planning process continues. I'm Mike McIntyre. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night. Good job. Good job.
Cleveland Connects is made possible in part by a grant from PNC Bank.